All right, so uh, welcome back to No Name Podcast International Edition. We are a Ukrainian cybersecurity podcast uh, working for infosec community in Ukraine since uh, 2016, in this shape and form at least. A lot over here is um, uh, doing this a little bit longer. <laughs> since the full-scale invasion of Russia, we've started episodes in English to support Ukraine, bring awareness of um, to cybersecurity aspect of the war uh, internationally, and make new connections and learn from our friends all over the world. And uh, our guest uh, definitely nails all these points today. Um, today, we are honored to have uh, Miko Hupanen. Uh, Miko is uh, a computer security expert, columnist in many uh, mainstream media. He assisted, uh, um, he advised uh, governments and assisted law enforcement in the United States, Europe, and Asia on cybercrime. And he's currently working on his book, uh, If It's Smart, It's Vulnerable. Uh, Miko is very active speaker. And uh, from his talk, you can see not only his understanding of cybersecurity issues, but also that he's a great ally to Ukraine, for which we are deeply thankful. Uh, you can also see that not uh, not from his talks, but from his, uh, his uh, address today. <laughs> and uh, welcome. And it's a sincere pleasure to have you, Mika. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, guys. It's a great honor for me to be a guest on your podcast. And I'm more than proud to wear my Vishavanka. Those of you who are not following us on live stream can't see it, but I am wearing a traditional Ukrainian uh, embroidery costume. I guess that's what you would call it. Exactly. <laughs> uh, hugely appreciate that. And uh, all the work you do uh, for Ukraine, uh, including, right? And um, basically we probably want to start, right, with um, after the few talks that you gave on, on what's going on, uh, what uh, do you think is the most important lesson learned uh, so far from the Russian offensive uh, cyber operations against Ukraine? Well, I guess the number one lesson is that we can't trust the Russians, but I guess we all knew that beforehand as well. And I'm saying that as someone who lives, well, rel relatively close to Russia myself, Finland has 1,000 350 kilometer of border with Russia. And we, we fought them over, over the history of our country multiple times. And of course, in the Second World War, both my grandfathers were fighting, fighting the Russians. And I guess we sort of forgot just how unpredictable Russia is, and especially Russians, Russian leaders are, how unpredictable Kremlin is. And I, for one, didn't see this war starting with everything we were following with the online attacks for the last eight years and the escalation in the amount of attacks and the real world escalation during the beginning of the year still i never i never thought that putin would be insane enough to attack but i was wrong and and and, and this is where we are did you guys saw it coming did you did you think it's going to happen this is an interesting uh, one because, well, go ahead, Vlad. It's it's not easy to it's not easy to assess from the hindsight, you know, because now it all seems so obvious, uh, especially uh, uh, for me because I have developed a taste for uh, history books, uh, especially written by uh, Russian dissidents, and uh, yeah, it all it all it all seems really logical if you pay attention. But I think we were carried away by our wishful thinking, uh, just just the um, belief in uh, that uh, something like this would not be happening in the civilized world in the mm -hmm. twenty in the twenty first century. Uh, it uh, it blurred our vision, right? And uh, as uh, Masha Gessen wrote, yeah, future is history. But if you learn history well, if you learn all your history lessons and you are pragmatic uh, with this knowledge, uh, it, it, it's, all, it's all pretty, it's all pretty rational, yeah? Uh, we all had a plan. We, we maybe not, not believed uh, the prospects of the war, but everyone had a plan. So it worked uh, pretty well. But I think if we didn't have the uh if we didn't have 2014 yeah the, the actual beginning of the war uh we wouldn't be ready for for this escalation in the 2022 but what about you ruslan and alex did you expect the war to start in february 
also i think uh similarly it's i think any everyone kind of deep down understood this with like their consciousness that it something like that is going to happen most of us i believe uh thought that is going to be more localized though so more you know maybe they want to um like get the eastern territories under full russian control or maybe expand it to the to the regions of actual regions of the you know of the eastern um to oblasts that are um under russian's control de facto from 2014 but not you know we didn't expect Lviv to be bombed uh or kiev and uh like vlad said if you know just a little bit about Ukrainian history and you know just a little bit about Russian history, it is so obvious. But I guess everyone was in, in such denial because I don't know, for me, you know, Second World War for me is just like seems such a distant thing from uh, just like from history books, even though it's just like a few generations away. Uh, so even when uh, when I got the news about like first explosions, I was like in the first five minutes, I was uh, always probably like some diversion, uh, you know, some just like planned explosion or whatever that they planned. Uh, I didn't realize there was a war rockets hitting, uh, hitting Ukraine. So yeah, uh, I would say everyone was a little bit surprised by the skill of it. Yeah, for, uh, for me, it's kind of the same, right? I'm all from Eastern Ukraine. And that's why like from 2014, right? We were prepared for escalation, but uh, uh, probably not for such full scale and barbaric uh, war. And uh, one interesting thing that like I, you know, trying to uh, also think about is that I really missed uh, this information war uh, kind of thing because like from 2014, from all these horrible events already started, right? Uh, my expectation was that again, more and more of Russian uh, cultural figures, right? They uh, uh, will be on the side of Ukraine, right? And they will be against the war. But apparently this wasn't the case. And apparently this is because I just, you know, uh, was really distanced from Russian uh, info space. And it really, it's, it just became even more horrible. And, uh, you know, actually, it was preparing for this war if you look at close attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I don't want to exaggerate the importance of cyber in this conflict, because it's pretty obvious that the, the, the majority of the action is somewhere else than in cyber right now, even though we, we are seeing more cyber activity than, than basically ever before. The real tragedies are happening somewhere else than in, in cyber. And, and to answer your original question, like, like what have we learned so far about the Russian offensive on cyber side during the first four months? Um, I guess the lesson is that cyber matters most before the missiles start flying and before the tanks start rolling in. Russia still operates a very traditional military and, and the leaders, the colonels, the generals are much more much more at ease in operating with traditional uh, tools of war than with cyber. Cyber is really handy when you don't want to launch a full-scale invasion, but once you are in full-scale invasion, then cyber takes the second stage. That's, I guess, what I, I would say we've learned so far. Oh, I, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, I didn't write it down, sorry, but it just came up to my memory right, right now. Because uh, uh, I, I was very impressed by, I don't know whether you saw it, I, I cannot remember the name of this intelligence colonel from Finland who uh, breaks down the Russian strategic history on YouTube. I think it's a very popular video. I don't know whether you saw it. So he works out uh, things that should be pretty obvious to me, but I just didn't elaborate on that because I come from Russia mm -hmm. and uh, I uh, had to learn Ukrainian as my third language, right? So I have to, I have to know all this stuff because I was raised there, but I didn't pay attention to it for the last eight years because I basically broke all my ties with uh, Russia and I just isolated me from this information space. And he, as an intelligence officer, didn't. And after he lays it down, it becomes absolutely obvious, you know, just on the basis of uh, deep down beliefs of the population, on the basis of major historical concepts, and on the basis, if, even such things that, as you know, um, French and German reluctance to punish. Russia are, are, become very just just historical consequences of them 
conquering Russia in different historic periods, you know? So he, he puts it very simple. It uh, has an air of uh, uh, populism, of course, because it's just a bunch of simple answers to complex questions, but it, it really resonates with, the, with, with, with everything going on. So yeah, it's, it seems like he has some theoretical basis under it. Sure. So, so are you referring to a YouTube video where he speaks Finnish and it has English subtitles? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's the video from Marti J. Kari, a retired colonel in the Finnish intelli military intelligence. I know Marti. So what, so what I wanted to ask you, yeah. because it's it's all too compelling, you know, uh, what's your um, perception of him? Do, does he has credibility? What's what's his like uh, background uh, for you as a Finnish citizen and insider who knows a thing or two about this stuff? Yeah. Should we should we listen to him? Marty is as credible as you can get. He's spent his whole life studying Russian cool. mindset and Russian military strategy and Russian military operations. Awesome. He spent his military career in in intelligence. Um, he has retired now, but uh, yep, we should listen to him, and uh, I'm sure we'll be able to post a link to Marty's video. Of in course. The show notes. Thank you. Thank you. Because I wanted to write with you. It's, it's, it's all too credible. And when it's too credible, it sounds like, you know, it's too good to be too true. much. Yeah, too, too good Funnily to be true. enough, um, I'm a host of a podcast myself. Unfortunately, it's a Finnish language podcast, which is called Herras Mies Hakkerit, which means the gentleman hackers. We had Marty as a guest two mm -hmm. years ago, and we were discussing all these things before the war broke out mm -hmm. again in Ukraine. Um, unfortunately, there's no translation of that podcast, but uh, I, I, I've known Marty for a decade. He, he is someone we should be listening to. Good. Awesome. Thank I you. I think technology should probably get pretty good soon uh, to the point where we would be able to listen to it as well. You don't um, know much about the language, also... do you? I know that <laughs> it's uh, one of the most uh, complex and difficult to learn things in the world, <laughs> well, if you are not Finnish. We have plenty of foreigners working for us. The headquarters for the company are here in Helsinki. And, and yeah, they, they, they keep complaining about the language. In fact, we have a handful of foreign employees who have, instead of studying Finnish, they've studied Swedish. You can become a citizen by speaking either one of our official languages, Finnish mm. and Swedish. Swedish is closely related to English, at much more closer than, than Finnish. And, and, and to German, they, so yeah, it's, yeah, it's German, much yeah. easier. Yep. Yeah. So it's apparently it's a hard language to learn. It's around uh, around uh, Hungarian, I guess, and Japanese. Yeah. So you have very few foreigners speaking speaking native and again, tongue in Finland. You walk the streets of Helsinki and you'll see small children speaking Finnish. So how hard can it be? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess Absolutely. So. Yeah. Back back to uh, Russian uh, cyber offensive. I think also. Uh, it comes from from some of your talks that you know the reason that uh, it becomes less less important during like the actual kinetic uh, operation is that one of the main properties that you highlighted for cyber cyber weapons right is deniability deniability and it's not as important anymore when you have open full scale invasion right so mm -hmm. I guess it becomes less lucrative to use correct yeah that's that's the most important feature of cyber weapons sure they are effective sure they are cheaper than kinetic weapons but deniability is really what makes them different and there's no need for deniability anymore in the conflict mm -hmm. that you are in the middle of and uh, what do you think sorry please go on. go ahead i just wanted to clarify what do you think about this hypothesis that uh, 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 it's 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 silly to say that uh, you know we can degrade the operations of a company for I don't know for for two days and they can be back to business in five days because they have backups anyway so cyber doesn't mean much right because um, this is uh, out of out of the strategic thinking of uh, the overall warfare operations right because if you think strategy you think that you do not deny. The operations of a company for two days you deny those operations during some other activities that are aligned temporarily with this cyber attack right otherwise it doesn't mean a lot but if if uh, synchronized with the um, uh, warfare in other domains it may mean something as we said with the uh, 
uh, via SAD attack, for, for instance, right? It was it was in time, so that's why it was effective. If it was one week before or a week after, it didn't make much sense, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you think uh, of uh, the overall perception of uh, Russian cyber in this uh, war escalation uh, as uh, lacking uh, strategic alignment, yeah? Uh, and uh, what do you think about the possible explanation that maybe the strategy was uh, was wrong, was uh, incomplete in the beginning? So that may be that may be the case, you know, because you cannot strategically align cyber with what's going on on the ground if you do not have strategy. That's right. Or and if your strategy is false, you know, based on the false intelligence as we apparently observe. Yeah, and and that's that's what seems to be going on. They they sort of got rushed into this war without synchronizing and really planning the way you would expect them to do, which sort of then explains why me and many others didn't believe that the war would start because it just didn't seem to be the case that they would have the right ingredients to fight a successful war. And turns out they didn't. They, mm -hmm. they, they, as far as we can tell, they were missing communications and they were missing strategy and they, didn't, they were not able to synchronize the operations happening in cyber and in the real world. Mm -hmm. Our best guess is that they are catching up and they are like they are understanding that this this they are in for the long haul and they have to be able to synchronize these better if they want to have any kind of meaningful use of cyber. Mm -hmm. um, there's been all these rumors loading floating around about the attack against DTEC, the energy company, uh, two yeah. weeks ago, which seems to be an example of synchronization. Um, is that the understanding from your end as well? It's either a synchronized action or a very unlikely coincidence, mm -hmm. you know. So there was a cyber attack de degrading their services exactly or almost exactly at the same time as they were hit with missiles. And this is energy creation and distribution. That's the largest energy distribution company in U Ukraine or second largest. Oh, definitely one of, but uh, maybe even the largest, yeah. Okay, yeah. And, and that's that's worrying. If they are able to like start to get the strategy in place and really combine cyber and kin kinetic at the same time, um, well, that's that's not the kind of development we'd like to see, but that seems to be an example of that. Let's, let's hope it was more of a coincidence than actual planning. But also, yeah, uh, actually... guys, I'm sorry to take it over, but just uh, the clarification after clarification pops up in my mind. Yeah, I absolutely. promise to shut up for, I don't know, at least 15 minutes after this. But uh, <laughs> no, I mean, one you. thing, <laughs> if you know how much of here is, but <laughs> I have to put it knowing me. So um, do you think that uh, from one side, it may be just, just a show off because uh, nothing major happened anyway after that? Uh, from other side, it can be uh, just exercises in order to better synchronize what's going on in different domains and enable enable some kinetic action with uh, some cybers. Uh, but uh, overall, as we all uh, are witnessing right now, overall, it might be good that they are showing this capability now because we will be better prepared for the future use of it, you know? Because everyone is saying that you included actually in this in this great talk that you gave recently that uh, Ukraine was resilient and prepared for the sole reason it, it's been attacked for quite a long time, right? Yep. And th from the theory side of it, um, applying cyber is the best way to to uh, make target more protected and uh, more capable to defend itself in the future. So overall, to take out of all this, what do you think is gonna be? It's gonna be positive or it's gonna be menacing and negative? Well, it might be that we've only seen the very beginning of this conflict and I'm, I'm worried that it will be a long war. Um, mm -hmm. And that's that might be problematic from our point of view and from Ukraine's point of view, because if Russia doesn't just, if they assume that they've already lost everything they can, they can lose, they've already been sanctioned as much as they can be sanctioned, um, and, and they assume they have more bullets than what the West would be willing to, to send to Ukraine, that might be the game they're playing here. Um, but mm -hmm. of course, 
we don't know. And our best hope is that it's it's just continues to be confusion, bad planning, and bad strategy from from Russians. But the thing about Ukrainian defense, I mean, the whole world has been impressed the way Ukraine is fighting. Um, of course, Putin expected Ukraine to fall in three days, which you didn't. Um, you, we've been impressed with your capability to defend your country, both in the real world and in the online world. And, and when, when I was giving my talk at the Sphere events, um, where I mentioned how Ukraine is the best country in Europe to defend against Russian governmental attacks, I was referring to the rule, I forgot who, who came up with the rule, but the idea is that once you do something for 10,000 hours, then you are a world-class expert in that something. So if you play the violin or if you pay, play the piano for 10,000 hours, then you are a world-class player. Um, and Ukraine has done its 10,000 hours in cyber defense against Ukraine, against Russian governmental attacks, which is different from every other country on the planet. Like no other country has been fighting concrete, real Russian cyber attacks for eight years. Um, whenever I go back to military refreshers, whenever I go back to my position in the Finnish reserve, um, we play war games, tabletop exercises, theoretical scenarios of what might happen, what Russia might do. And then we come up with solutions on, on what we would do that that's make believe. What Ukraine has been doing for eight years is not make-believe. It's very real. And that's the difference. Now, Ukraine, of course, has big challenges as well. There's tons of legacy systems and, and investments in IT are not at the same level as most of the Europe. Um, so defending a country, big country with tens of millions of people and tons of infrastructure is hard. But the expertise you've gathered over the years really is a difference here. And that's that way, what, what, what really makes Ukraine unique legacy may actually be one of our strong <laughs> strong sides because we still have a lot of systems where technically we can pull the plug and just keep operating snobs uh, or whatever right the analog systems um so we did come a long way for these eight years because as, as you mentioned in precarpatiable energo the the mistake was pretty pretty childish uh, right mm -hmm. in the sense that they just lacked uh, network segregation um but uh definitely you know over time they they, they learn and how, hopefully it'll however keep this however way. exactly what you said Pato Oblenergo was a great example of a failure and a success sure the network segmentation wasn't the kind of segmentation you would wish you would have however the recovery was able because of the manual and legacy systems that the, you know you didn't need computers to get power back on so it was an example of both yeah, and uh, what do you think would be uh, probably the most important component to kind of try keep it this way? Like, do we do we want to leave legacy systems in? Do we want to make some I don't know governmental programs? Like, how do we? How can we? You know, stay on top of this um, over time? Um, we don't have. What's a choice. the best the best approach? There are no alternatives. Um, we are going more and more digital, more and more developed, more and more technical societies. All of the societies are going that direction. There are no options. We, we don't want to stay behind. Uh, we don't want to be backwards. We don't want to go back to stone ages or, or, or well, the dependency on connectivity, the dependency on digital systems, the dependency on internet is exactly the same kind of dependency we've built for the last 150 years regarding electricity. And sure, we could argue that if our great grandfathers 150 years ago would have seen that, you know, electricity is such a big innovation that it's going to become mandatory and eventually societies won't be able to function without electricity, if they would have chosen not to embrace electricity and not to start building electricity grids now we wouldn't be relied on electricity but clearly that would have been the wrong choice because electricity has brought us so much good so many benefits and exactly the same thing applies to connectivity we are now the generation which is bringing connectivity and it will be mandatory for all future generations and even though we see the risks that eventually cutting internet will cut 
everything in our societies. We'll cut power and, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll cause factories to stop running. Even though we see that, we should still make the jump. It's the right jump to make. We will be facing new risks, new problems, but the alternative is worse. So it's, it's a scary jump, but we can't stay in old systems. We can't stay in legacy. The right decision is to move forward. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah, I think with most of these technologies, it's more about uh, the pros outweighing the cons. Uh, got it. So thanks. And uh, I, I actually also wondered, so since Russian attacks on other countries and allies, partners of Ukraine, which is pretty much like the entire West, are notably increasing, um, even like in the last weeks, um, do you think European countries were uh, prepared to a reasonable extent, of course? Uh, what do you think uh, you know, they still should prepare for? In this in this conflict in this war, U.S. intelligence and U.K. intelligence saw the developments that we saw in February early on, and they were trying to tell the world. And since we ignored them back then, maybe we should now listen to them. And when you listen to the intelligence briefings coming from the White House, coming from CISA, the Critical Infrastructure Protection Agency of USA. And they are telling that they believe that Russia and Russian aligned attackers, including non-governmental attackers, will be targeting the West, will be targeting Europe, will be targeting the United States. Maybe now we should listen. And looking at how prepared countries like Italy, or Lithuania, or now Norway have been, as they've been targeted by attacks from Russia, um, clearly we could have been even better prepared. But preparedness regarding safeguarding critical infrastructure is far from easy because critical infrastructure, even non-critical infrastructure is not controlled and maintained by our governments, regardless of what the What's the strategic view held by our decision makers? They don't own the electricity grids or the water distribution uh, facilities or food processing plants or radio stations or bus companies. It's all owned by private companies in each country. And, and, and that means that the real crucial thing regarding keeping countries running when they are being hit by attacks like these is that your public-private partnerships work, that there's communication and synchronization, and that companies, individual for-profit companies are ready to carry their load regarding keeping their countries and their societies running during times of crisis. This is the crucial thing to do. And I see big differences in different countries on how well this is done. I guess uh, having effective communications is now key both in, in actual battle, in preparedness for cyber war and, and whatnot. Um, also, it seems like Russia is the main driver of information security in, in the West now. Yep. Um, so, so we have um, a, you think, um, uh, yeah, yeah go Ruslan, ahead. we have a related question from audience uh, is actually like, uh, what should we propose to other countries? Is it more about, uh, uh, you know, like securing their networks and uh, investing in blue teams? or it's more about you know, offensive, uh, uh, offensive operations? Well, it all starts from leadership. Um, Ukraine has a ministry of digital development or-, or Tra Transformation, digital, digital transformation, transformation, yes. Yes, yes. Most countries don't, my country doesn't. Uh, in fact, in Finland, um, internet uh, and, and telecommunications is technically part of the Ministry for Transportation. You see, we are transporting data packets on the internet. That's the logic, I guess, why it's in there, which really is a bit surprising. Um, oh, um, we had the same. We had the same about uh, 10 to 15 years ago. It was yep. just the department in the Ministry of Transport right, and Infrastructure. Right. Well, that's the way we still have it today, which is a bit weird. In fact, in Finland, Finland is a small country, five and a half million people, but it's very technical, very nerdy. Lots of coders, I mean, home of Linux, home of Nokia, all that. Yet, 
our decision makers, our ministers, our members of the parliament, very few of them are engineers or coders or technical people at all. We do have pretty awake leadership. Uh, as you might know, our prime minister is a relatively young lady um, and, and half of our cabinet are relatively young ladies, which is exactly the kind of cabinet you want to have during times, uh, year-long pandemics and other crises that we've been going through. You don't want to, have, want to have old and tired guys running the country when you are in the middle of real crisis. You want to have people who can really lo work long hours. But the fact that decision makers might not fully understand the technical implications of the things they are, are deciding about is, is worrying. And I don't have to look very far. All I have to look is, is 80 kilometers away. We have Estonia as our dear neighbor, um, which is a great example of a country which really has gone through. Well, they haven't gone through digital transformation. They kickstarted from zero when they became independent. They dropped all the leg mm -hmm. legacy behind and they've had really uh, great leadership um, bringing the country on in, in all of these aspects that we've been, we've been discussing about. So, so it's, it's, it, it really starts from the leadership and then it starts from practical things like the, the fact that country has to have a, a highly functional CERT or National Cybersecurity Center or something like that to make sure that uh, the country, the government, the leaders have the right information and they are able to provide the right kind of guidance for private companies, which are the ones that actually run the infrastructure of our societies. But again, getting to the previous point, uh, uh, it's, it's not exactly 15 minutes, sorry guys, but uh, getting to the previous point, do you think that uh, this is a kind of uh, Darwinian directional selection? You know? They didn't no. do it on their own. They did it in response to the bronze soldier and all, oh. all that mess that uh, Russians uh, made of their internet back then. Um, it wasn't that simple. Sure, the, the, the uh, Red War One, which is what some people call the bronze soldier mm -hmm. denial of service attack 11 years ago in, in Estonia, uh, sure, it was a big deal. However, for example, the NATO CCD COE, the Center of Excellence um, that they operate in Tallinn, that was already in underway by that time. So it's it's quite common understanding that everything was kickstarted from the big denial of services, uh -huh. and service attacks. That wasn't exactly the case. I'm sure it helped. I'm sure they got more resources uh -huh. and budget after that. But but they were already so on the way. And 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 there, more, guess, more of a catalyzation not causation yeah, yeah that's that's what i think it was and and but nevertheless right now they are in great shape and and if we are a small country they are a much smaller country and they have a sizable it industry right now they have like 10 unicorn companies or 12 unicorn companies and the capability for them their citizens to do anything online is probably among the best in the world fully digital identities setting up companies in five minutes online it, it's, it's pretty remarkable. And of course, it's easy for them to do things like that when it's a small country and they have no legacy and their leaders are fairly technical. But uh, that's the kind of future I hope to see more in, in, in all countries. Uh, yeah, exactly. So do, do you think there is more or like, is there enough collaboration right now between the countries or should we, should we have more? And uh, it also becomes tricky with like policies, different policies in different countries. Um, but basically, it seems like the close collaboration here is key, right? So if every if every country shares information of what happened to them, how you know exactly what are the indicators of compromise, what happened, and so on, everyone uh, should benefit from it. Though sometimes I would say that countries might be a little bit hesitant, you know, to share the holes in their in their security of critical infrastructure. Yes. And you would be right, um, especially when it comes to intelligence gathering. Intelligence agencies historically have been collecting all this critical information and they've been very good at sitting on the information or using, quite typically using it as a means of barter. Like we, we know this, we're, we're, we can tell you what we know if you tell us what you know about this. That's how intelligence agencies uh, historically used to work. And that's not really useful in cyber because in cyber, time is of essence. We need those IOCs now. They're useless 
in six hours. We need them right now and we, we can't negotiate. We must be able to get the information from any country, any friendly country that has been hit by something particular. So we would be able to protect our country before it hits us or we will be able to detect when it hits us. So sure, demanding better information exchange, better co communication, that's, that's pretty obvious. Um, and, and, and that's what we should be expecting, especially inside Europe and inside EU, definitely. Uh, obviously, Finland is an EU country, so information exchange and harmonization of laws is, is pretty far uh, done already in the EU. But we must not forget that we don't have global laws, uh, and, and, and we never will. We have certain international laws and certain, loose, uh, certain rules for... for um, you know, waging war and all that, but laws will never be completely synchronized. And that's one of the challenges we have um, because internet has no borders and there are no countries on the internet, at least not in this sense. <clears throat> yeah, we have a, uh, another question, like uh, a follow-up uh, from audience. Like, so should it be like uh, the cyber defense uh, developed uh, in groups or alliances like NATO? Or, you know, like, I, I guess like the question is like, well, to speed up, like, should it be like some peer-to-peer -peer country corporations? NATO is a great example because NATO doesn't have joint defense in this sense. It's individual countries which have their own armies, their own defense capabilities. Uh, and then they belong an alliance, a military alliance, where they will promise to work together and defend each other. Um, NATO can try to, again, be the middleman, be the, be the postman in the middle to act as an information exchange joint and run the center of excellence uh, systems. But I do believe countries will want to be able to keep the keys in their own hands, not just in cyber defense, but defense in, in general. Um, some really close allies um, might be able to synchronize their defense to a certain level. Finland and Sweden are pretty close allies. And we have we run joint um, air defense exercises, for, for example. But in principle, in general, I think countries want to have their own defense in their own hands. And that will also include cyber. And we must accept the fact that the best capabilities in the world um, in both offensive cyber as well as defensive cyber are in United States of America. Especially in, in offensive side, this is really easy to see by simply looking at budgets. Whenever we speak about cyber attacks and cyber attack capability, we typically speak about Russia and maybe China. And then the discussion veers into Iran and North Korea. And everybody seems to be forgetting USA. USA has been putting more money longer than any other country in building offensive capability. They have the best offensive capability in the world. We just rarely see it. And we don't see it because that's how good it is. They don't get caught. Russians get caught all the time. Chinese get caught all the time. They don't care. They, they know nothing's going to happen even if they get caught. For USA and their allies like UK, getting caught for doing offensive cyber is embarrassing. They go to great lengths to make sure they will never get caught. And the, as the end result, we have very few cases where they've really been caught. They have been caught. We have those cases, but most of them go, I'm expecting that most of their attacks go completely undetected and we will never even know if they happened. And uh, just maybe to be completely clear on this topic, uh, how do you think, why do you think NATO, uh, Obviously, as your country is much closer to the ascension, uh, why do you think NATO declares joint forces, right, and joint deployments in all domains except for cyber? And calls for member nations to assist by applying sovereign capabilities in cyber uh, in, in joint missions, but, but not... Uh, um, putting up together something offensive the same way they did um, the CCD Soya for defensive side of it. Yeah, well, CCD COE in Estonia, I wouldn't even call it as a defensive center of excellence. It's more like research uh, and, and, and academic center and defining 
Ability. And officially, I guess it's even separated. Yeah, yes, it's it's not like native structure. It's, it's, uh, yeah. it's associated it's, with native, but it's, it's, legally it's, it's, it's different. They do thing. great work. It's it's a great center, but it's not a unit which would defend all of NATO against mm -hmm. cyber attacks. That that's not what they're trying to do. Um, I guess the answer to your question is that it, it, it's still early days for for cyber. It is the mm -hmm. newest of the domains where we fight our wars. But it is a domain where we do fight our wars. And I guess those developments um, will be happening in the future. I also expect that we will see rules of law for cyber war, just like we have rules of law for, for real world. I mean, you're not supposed to bomb churches or, or, or Red Cross facilities. Um, or you're not supposed to use chemical weapons, things like that. Those kinds of rules we will have for cyber war as well. Um, and, and some of the things I think we will internationally agree upon altogether will be things like that if you deploy cyber weapons, they must not continue working and spreading and being destructive forever. They must have a kill date. They must stop operation after- No Stuxnet months. in the future. <laughs> Stuxnet had a kill date. I don't know if you know this, but Stuxnet- Did it? We, we, we found Stuxnet in 2010. He had a kill date, I believe, in June 2012. It doesn't oh. work anymore. If, if, if I give you a I, I thumb drive with Stuxnet, it won't do anything at all anymore, which is a great example. I, I believe US intelligence and, and NSA, which I believe was behind Stuxnet, I think they were thinking about these already back then in 2010 or 2009 when they were developing it. So it, it, it's, it's, it did have a kill date. Another thing which I think would make sense in cyber weapons would be things like that you would be able to identify who did it. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe not during the conflict, but at least after the conflict, using, I don't know, public key, cryptography, and, 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 and signatures inside the malware that you could prove that this was our weapon uh, and, mm -hmm. and something like that. Um, I think countries in general would agree that this would be a good idea. Uh, and th those are the kind of things which we will see when this field matures. It's still a very new field. Uh, the, the best example I have about how new field it is, is that when I started analyzing malware in the early 1990s, if somebody would have told me that cyber war would no longer, I mean, or computer security attacks would no longer be spreading on floppy disks, that they would be spreading online, that it wouldn't all be written by teenage boys for fun, but they would actually be used by organized crime gangs and they would be used by nation states to fight wars, that would have been science fiction. And that's only 30 years ago. So mm. it's still very early days. Yeah, I think we fought conventional wars for thousands of years, and this well, one is like maybe for a decade. Well, one more thing maybe to discuss uh, just for a couple of minutes. So uh, <laughs> this brings in very interesting topic, guys, I'm, I, I, I assure you. So uh, the main reason, I guess, why... Um, the U.S. put so much money into cyber budgets is is these constraints, right? So in order to make it uh, happen in the best um, operationally um, effective way, and in the, and in the same time not uh, show off, not leave traces for attribution, you have to you have to put a lot of money in it, right? So what you are saying about international cyber warfare laws and all this kind of stuff that by analogy will some sometime in the future transition from what we have now for conventional warfare, uh, it will, of course, improve uh, the state of affairs in the West. But we all know that Russians, uh, Koreans, I mean, North Koreans and the uh, Iranians and all the others who will deploy the capability until the time, they will just ignore it. So it will be still cheap for them because they don't care. And it will be much more expensive for everyone else who wants to care and who want to do it responsibly and uh, responsibly and not to create uh, collateral damage, all this kind of stuff. You know, so does this asymmetry serve us well, really? No, but we don't have an option. Um, the fact that we know some players won't play with the same rules doesn't mean that we should act unethically. Fair countries, enough. countries are banning um, like landmines, even though they're very effective in ground war. They're just very mm -hmm. inhuman. Um, and, and they decide to ban them 
because it's the right thing to do, even though some countries decide to continue using them. Um, it's a hard choice to make, but there really are very few easy choices in, in, in these things. I wanted I this the, to sound the... out loud, really, because, yeah, it's, uh, it's the very thing that distinguishes uh, civilized nations from, from the rest of the world. Exactly. The, the paradox to me seems that, you know, for a civilized nation that is going to find uh, those, those kind of conventions and rules that everyone agrees on, it's highly unlikely for them to lead to a, you know, a kind of conventional war between the two. And exactly. uh, the one that's likely to actually have the war. Yeah. Functional yeah. democracy if, that if, puts if, all this stuff in order. Yeah. Exactly. If they're developed enough to agree on that, they'll probably find another resolution than, than fighting a war between, between the two. Um, so I guess with it, with, um, in the same uh, topic, is uh, hack back or like cyber deterrence? Uh, do you think it it makes sense? Uh, should we develop in this direction, or is it too dangerous? Should we kind of just as still as a Western safe, I don't know, peaceful world? Uh, should we just uh, refrain from those kind of scenarios? Um, fighting back works. Or, or hacking back works. I see no reason to, to shy away from that. Of course, rules are different during times of peace. If, if your company gets hacked, it might not be legal for your company or your employees or your consultants to hack back the hackers. They might actually break the law. What we're seeing right now in Ukraine, when Russia hacks Ukrainian targets, of course, it's a fair game to hack Russians back. It is a war. Uh, everything go, almost everything goes. In peacetime, you're not allowed to shoot and kill people. During wartime, it's, it, it, it's different rules. Um, and, 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 and that's, that's, um, that's, that's quite, quite clear to me. The question about deterrence is, is, a, is a different question. It, it, it's much more complex. When we are not in active war, when we're not in active conflict, the most important power of weapons is in deterrence, not in using the weapons, but in showing the weapons. This is the reason why we do military parades. This is the reason why you can go to Wikipedia and get the exact amount of fighter jets each country has. This is the reason why we haven't needed nuclear weapons in war since 1945. The last time they were used in war was in 1945. The power of nuclear warheads is in having the nuclear warheads, not in using the nuclear warheads. Russia, funnily enough, Russia has never even done nuclear, nuclear weapons testing. The last nuclear weapons tests they did were done by Soviet Union in 1991, which is the same year when USA did their last hmm. uh, nuclear weapons Didn't know. test. Yeah, 30 years. Interesting. Quite amazing. Now, the power of weapons like these is in having them. And then the question becomes, what kind of deterrence, what kind of power like that does cyber weapons have? And they have almost none, because we don't oh. know. I mean, you can't- uh, honey, you, honey to my ears. Yeah, but because, <laughs> because we will never have a military parade to show off your nerds and geeks. And even and if the, you- The effect is not strategic. It's not It is nukes. not. And, 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 and if, you, if you really want to show them, like if you really want to have practical deterrence out of cyber weapons, then you have to run a military war games or military uh, uh, rehearsal and show your enemies what exactly you're exploiting and how. And you can't do that because if you show exactly what you're doing, guess what? Now exactly. they can do the same thing. So they will get a copy of your weapon. This property applies to no other weapons. Cyber weapons are the only ones that you can't show because if you show now your enemy has the same weapon. So deterrence is hard. It's almost non-existent. And this is problematic because cyber weapons have an expiration date. They, they rust just like mm -hmm. real world weapons. They only work for a limited amount of time. They target specific vulnerabilities which might no longer be there in five years. They target specific operating system which changes and whatever you build will no longer be applicable which means you have, you're spending a lot of money to develop these attacks. They have a short lifespan and there's no benefit for them. There's no deterrence that you got out of it. If the time span expires, your whole investment just went down the drain and you got nothing out of it. And that's unique in cyber weapons. 
that's that's actually interesting all... because we we all remember not Peter, right? We all remember Stuxnet. We all remember original Viper, like with W, right? So, um, and the, I do not remember the study, but uh, I, I I think I, there, there is a fact in my head that uh, zero days are uh, have relatively short lifespan. So even if they are employed as cyber weapon, right? It's about seven years. So uh, if you have it, once you use it, you basically blow it. It's either transitioned to the other side during incident response, right? Or it's patched and you cannot apply it anymore, right? So this, this kind of deterrence, just do another NotPetya or another Stuxnet every seven years and uh, everyone will know that you have cybers. It doesn't work either, right? Yeah. Yeah. Of course, we do have the big picture on deterrence. I, I, I told you myself, USA has a lot of offensive capability. But then when you go down the steps a little bit beyond the obvious countries, beyond the superpowers, what's the offensive cyber capability for Vietnam? I have no clue. There's no easy way to find out. What's I can the tell offensive... you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm all ears. What's the offensive cyber capability of Vietnam? Uh, I, I'm just kidding, of course, but they were uh, trying to harvest some uh, some contacts, some peers of mine in Ukraine for some custom exploit development uh, way before the actual like first attacks they, they conducted. So they definitely have something. It's mm -hmm. not like pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's not compared to I don't know Israel or right. or Great and, Britain, of and course. That's my point like exactly. That. We, we we know countries have something, but we have no nothing concrete. It's not it's not like you could go on Wikipedia and read it from there, which is what mm -hmm. you can do with fighter jets and aircraft carriers. Those you mm -hmm. will find from Wikipedia. Yeah, well, we all do secretly hope that all Russians' nukes are you know all rusty, plundered, and unoperational. But that's not a good plan, though. I would put money on. Gotta prepare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so with, uh, uh, like we discussed, basically there are certainly some differences in in cyber uh, domain, uh, as you would say, right? And it's very closely related to informational war in general, uh, whether through online or any means, really. Um, what's your? Um, do you estimate the threats like? Uh, deep fakes, you know, adversarial uh, machine learning, like any kind of, you know, uh, fake uh, media or fake, uh, fake news, if you will, uh, anything that kind of can uh, lead to misleading or misinformation in, in general public, especially at large scale, uh, would that be a, a realistic threat or rather not realistic, but important threat? And, uh, you know, what, what, we sh what should we do with it? Troll factories and mass shaping of individual opinions through targeted news and targeted ads worked like a charm five years ago, back then when Trump was elected and the St. Petersburg troll factory was able to sway the opinion of the American public. And, and they did the same in UK with Brexit. That's a great example of a kind of attack which, which works for a while, but then people, regardless of how little we can trust the general knowledge of the average citizen, eventually people will learn and they will become wary and they will start thinking that, you know, that those persons who keep replying with those opinions into every thread might not be normal people. They might be bots, they might be paid actors, they might be trolls. People will learn and the, the same thing which will apply do all the other technologies, including the ones you mentioned, like, like deep fakes or deep fake voice generation or, or fake videos. Um, it will be a problem for a while. And then we, people will start expecting tricks and, 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 and uh, stunts like that. And they will, they will learn to double check things like that. And right now, of course, we all know that deep fakes are possible and doable. We've seen them. Um, which is a different thing from the fact that we, I don't believe we've actually seen real time deep fake video used in a real malicious attack anywhere yet. There's regularly 
speculation and news stories, how it might have been used somewhere. And then when you go and try to find the facts, you realize that it wasn't the deep fake, it was something else. Um, it will happen, but I think it hasn't happened yet. Well, deep fakes are like my biggest concern is because uh, as technology gets better and better over time, it becomes harder and harder to distinguish. Uh, like for example, during during the war, right? Maybe you heard about the legend about the uh, ghost of Kiev, uh, of Kiev, who's uh, like a, you know amazing pilot, and there were seemingly videos of of actual uh, battle, but they were all basically just kind of computer generated or just even uh, recordings from a simulator. Um, they were possible to distinguish, but as everything gets better, as you know, especially if a uh, country puts you know professionals to the work. Um, it might be very difficult to distinguish or it will take time. And if you see, you, you know, you get a video of uh, Biden declaring war in some country and it takes days to figure out if it's genuine or not, it, I don't know, that just seems really scary to me. And the, the uh, other part is that the industry of like recording equipment doesn't do anything to address it. Like we've been talking on this podcast, I believe a couple of years ago, like why don't we have, you know, digital signatures in the camera so that you can either prove that this is a camera that recorded this data or or, or not basically and mm -hmm. it is this data that has been recorded or generated from from a computer yep. you know what i mean because pika is a mess maybe no? <laughs> well that's yes <laughs> just kidding but you know uh, uh did you did, do you remember this klitschko case just just this week or something sure yeah so uh i think that uh, AI will enable both offense and defense side of anything it's applied to. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I'm not sure it's gonna it's gonna happen synchronously and symmetrically, but uh, eventually it will. I think sure. it scales both sides of it. I agree. I agree. And and we've been using machine learning in in cyber defense for endpoint security and server security, and network security for 17 years which is a really long time to be working in this field. And all those years we've been waiting for attackers to start deploying large scale machine learning framework for their malware campaigns or self modifying malware code or things like that. And we're still waiting. So it, it, it might, I mean, why would the attackers start investing their time and money into new attacks when they don't have to, if they make great money, with the current attacks, the criminals are not going to do it. Governments use other means of getting their, their access to the information they need. Um, but it will happen eventually. So it's going to happen in the next 12 to 24 months is my best guess. That's when we will start to see machine learning fueled uh, offensive cyber attacks. So I guess like uh, the head of our one of our largest funds, uh, probably the largest fund, uh, Come Back Alive, told that um, you can never, you know, enter the battle uh, as you like or as prepared as you want. You kind of enter as, you know, as you can. You just do the best you can. And it seems like in this case, we'll just do the best we can because it seems like it's going to be a mess until we kind of try to figure out, but that's the best that we can do. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's also a great example on how to keep your, how to be ready for um, fake news. I'm always suspecting when someone says that this, there's a new phishing attack out there which uses machine learning or CEO scams are now using fake copied voices of the CEOs. I always want to see the evidence. And typically when you demand the evidence, you realize that there is no evidence. It's just a story. It's just an excuse. By the way, speaking of which, uh, our audience asks you to verify yourself. Maybe someone is uh, just suspecting us in putting not uh, the real Miko he put in here but the deep fake <laughs> I, I, I thought I verified myself by showing my floppy disk exactly sort of... exactly no, no one, one else <laughs> no one else would have this no one no else would have it have it handy it. right like I, I just took it out from my bag uh, I, I don't even have the three three inches one anywhere in my house but, I have but rotational, I have rotational HDDs are still somewhere somewhere in the <laughs> <laughs> or my backyard or something so uh your book if it's smart it's vulnerable right do you want to tell us a little bit about it and uh exactly and uh does it mean that anything that's digital and connected is vulnerable you know we, we now have uh toothbrushes and everything connected and uh you know uh, talking to the internet is it a good trend do you see like how do you 
see developments in this realm, especially the IoT world? Well, the title of the book, if it's smart, it's vulnerable. That's the Hippon and law. And, and that's exactly what it means. When we add connectivity and functionality to everyday devices, they become vulnerable. And this is a very, very pessimistic law, but it's also true. Um, the example I always use is, is, is my wristwatch. Like I, I use an old mechanical wristwatch, which has no CPUs or memory or connectivity in it, which means it's unhackable. Then when you take a look at smartwatches like Apple Watch, they might be well protected, but it is a computer, it is online. Is it hackable? Of course it's hackable. So when we add functionality to things, they become vulnerable. That's the way it is. And, and, and there's no stopping that. This revolution will happen whether we like it or not. Yeah, one of the things that I recently realized is that it would be really easy to trick me in believing what the wrong time is because I literally do not have analog watches anymore and any clocks whatsoever, aside from maybe a, a microwave. So if you would literally change time every every day on my on all of my devices, which is totally possible, I, it took me it would take me a while to figure out. But like, should we basically what's your message? Should we be paranoid or is this more a call to action to kind of improve things and be ready for them? We won't be able to stop the revolution. Everything will be going online. Every, every device that we plug into the electricity grid, we will also be plugging into the connectivity grid. And this happens for various different reasons. I go to the reasons deeper in my book, but it's just, trust me, it's going to happen, which means we have to be able to secure these devices. And this is not going to happen naturally. When you go to the shop, shopping for a washing machine, the number one question you're asking is price. Like how much is it? The number two question is how much clothes can it wash in one go? The third question is color. You never even think about asking questions like how well is it protected? Does it have a firewall? Does it have a filter for malicious IP package? Does it have endpoint protection? Yet all washing machines, almost all washing machines today are online. They are computers. And this if, if it doesn't happen naturally, then we have to somehow make it happen. One way societies fix um, problems like this is with regulation. Let's regulate security. Let's make sure IoT devices are safe by regulating them. And I'm not a big fan of regulation either. I think regulation almost always fails, but um, voluntary certifications and, and government assigned secure device emblems might be the way forward. And then we have all other related problems to solve, like how do you handle the life cycle of devices which have a really long life cycle, like cars. If you buy a car today, well, you're buying a computer. How many years, how many decades will you be needing security patches for that car, which is a computer? Great questions, and we don't really have good answers for these questions yet. However, the book, isn't just about IoT. It's actually a collection of things I've learned over the last 30 years. And then my ideas about what's going to happen in the next 30 years. And I added a lot of case studies and stories and anecdotes and things I've seen during my career to keep it entertaining. And uh, it's, it's coming now in August. So I'm really uh, excited to see how, how people will find it. Definitely looking forward to that. Vlad, well, you wanted to, to add something? No, no, I just, yeah, I can't wait. I can't read uh, All right, right. Uh, yeah, I was just want to wanna say that we're almost at time here. And I guess the last one I wanted to squeeze in is that as you as we've just seen, uh, you showed off your floppy disk. So um, you seem to to like vintage tech and, you know, history of technology in general, um, as uh, many of us do. Uh, so do you think cyber and cyber war, information security in general, will it become vintage or marginal one day, uh, you know, like bank robberies or piracy uh, right now. Piracy, I mean, more of like sea piracy than, than cyber. Well, cybercrime won't be going away. Um, we will have cybercrime as long as we have bad people and we will always have bad people. However, um, cyber attacks will become of historic importance and they will become vintage and they have to be archived and preserved just like any other part of our culture. 
I've done my small part in trying to save this part of the culture. I've been volunteering at the Internet Archive for, I think, seven years now, building a collection of old malware, old viruses, especially the ones which showed something visible to users during the early days of the PC virus problem. Uh, this is called the, the uh, uh, Malware Museum at the Internet Archive. We actually use um, virtual machines inside browsers to execute old windage malware code, which you can safely run on your own computer to see what old viruses were doing when you got infected by them in 1991 or 1993. You'll find that site by Googling for Malware Museum. Awesome. Um, so since we're in time, I guess the last, uh, the last question we typically ask is um, what would be your uh, advice on personal safety online for, uh, you know, for our, our people in these times? And uh, over the last couple of episodes, we covered, you know, security of, of your phone, how, how to use it and how not to use it, like on, when you are on occupied territories. Um, we covered the dangers of using your phone to report military action, which kind of drags you into the context a little bit. So you may not be considered civilian anymore, though it's not that it would matter to Russia anyway. Um, so aside from those two, is there anything in particular you would, you would want you know, people to be aware of? Simply a reminder that when you are discussing sensitive topics in groups in in chats in irc on on telegram on signal make sure you know who's in the chat make sure you really know and, and understand who are the members of of the people in the chat make sure they are really the people who you believe are the people in the chat um, there are moles there are uh, uh, the enemy is listening and they are trying to infiltrate discussion groups and find out how you're trying to defend your infrastructure and your country. So simply a reminder of that. Um, it applies in the real world, but in the online world, it's all too easy to think that you are in a private chat room with five friends and actually there's someone else listening in. It's such a great advice. And I can't believe we actually missed it until our like what third episode, because uh, just recently, my friend who's uh, getting like he's trying to get gather funds and and send help to to Ukraine. Um, he spotted like a few fake accounts that would be talking to to his friends, uh, you know, asking for donations. And uh, since everyone kind of knows him personally, it was uh, very easy to to be convincing. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that's a great point, and we gotta be also mindful that even when we use Signal, um, what we actually be, can be sure about is that. Uh, we are talking to a certain phone number and we're not exactly sure who's the person behind, behind it. It just protects end to end, but it doesn't tell you who's on the other end unless you have video, which we don't in Signal. I believe we don't. We do. Not yet. We do. We do. We do, of course. course. Yeah. Yeah. But, but we Visual identification be, 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 before any uh, mask, like more than two people, you know, and someone supposedly will be keep keeping their silence <laughs> through the call. Everyone is turning the cameras on and then turning them off. Right. And, and before we, we wrap up, I want to send special thanks. Um, as mentioned in the beginning of the podcast, I'm wearing my Vishawanka, which is the traditional costume, which I got from uh, Sviaroslav and Roman from ISSP as they were visiting me. So thank you for, uh, for my Vishawanka. Yeah, it looks really cool on you. Yeah, and it's in the Finnish colors of the Finnish flag, which I really appreciate. Yeah, we will make sure the screenshots from this broadcast will make it to the social media and retweet it as many times as we can convince people to do it. <laughs> that Absolutely, that was yeah. a great honor and uh, and a tremendous pleasure. The honor is all mine, and I just want to re-emphasize that the rest of the world knows that Ukraine is not just fighting for Ukraine, but Ukraine is fighting for the whole world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for, you, for being an ally here and for, uh, you know, for bringing this to, to other people as well through your, your continuous talks and, and work. Uh, really appreciate it. And yes, Vishwanka does look great, great on you. <laughs> With that, I just want to remind that uh, in the chat, there are links uh, to the trusted funds that you can use to help support Ukraine. And also please uh, do help and support in any other means uh, you deem are 
uh, you know, reasonable to you. It doesn't have to be huge or small. Uh, it doesn't even have to be donations. Uh, sometimes uh, even uh, informational or, you know, uh, ideological support also means a lot, which is uh, something that Mika is doing a lot and uh, hope everyone else uh, does too. And uh, thank, with that, thank you so much.